Let's pretend you are going hunting. You pack a buck knife, a bow, arrows cleft from straight weeds, wild in my front yard. You perch in an oak, yearning for the chill that signals harvest. The copper of pine needles falls. Whether you catch me or not is not the point. You look first at wandering deer, the bigger prize, full of meat, with hide to cure. But keep an eye peeled for upland birds too, smaller, easier to mount once ensnared. You don't need a guide to hollow lungs of song. Yes, I said, birds are easy to work with. Refugee bones that gift flight, delicate and slight, may as well be shadow. I have always made myself invisible. I mean to say, I am still this trembling breath of a comma, this coincidental object of your want. Beautiful. Namaskara and welcome to the 2020 edition of the Bengaluru Poetry Festival, where all borders dissolve as we go online. I'm Shikha Malvia, a poet and publisher based in California. And today I'm in conversation with award-winning poet Rajiv Mahavir, currently based in Massachusetts whose work and identity are so multi-hued that I hesitate to give it any labels. Rajiv is the author of The Cowherd Son, winner of the Kundaman Prize, and The Taxidermist Cut, winner of the Four-Way Books Intro to Poetry Prize, and translator of I Even Regret Night, Holy Songs of Demerara by Lal Bihari Sharma, which received a Penheim Translation Fund Grant Award. His memoir won the 2019 Reckless Books New Immigrant Writing Prize and is forthcoming next year. Currently, Rajiv is an assistant professor of poetry at Emerson College and translations editor at the prestigious Waxwing Journal. Rajiv, we're so honored to have you be part of the Bangalore Poetry Festival. Thank you so much for being here, or as they say in Kannada, Dhanyavad Gulu. Oh yeah, well thank you for inviting me. The honor is totally mine. So um, let's begin at the beginning, right? Um, and this might be a general question, but I love, love, love asking other poets this question. Um, so poetry is often regarded as a calling and not a profession. And for those who do pursue it full time, it can be challenging. How did you come into poetry? How did the journey begin? That's, this is a great question. I love these questions of origins because sometimes I, I find myself even asking the same question of, you know, just what, what, what is this life that I am living? Um, I started through poetry. Um, I started, I came to poetry through examination of my grandmother's folk songs, as a matter of fact. So, you know, we're Caribbean Indian or, uh, you know, in the, 18, in, the, in the 1800s during the system of indentureship, um, indentured laborer. Uh, my ancestors moved to the Caribbean to work the sugarcane plantations. Um, and my grandmother, my, my dad's mom, um, she knew all of these Bhojpuri songs and she could like sit there and sing them from beginning to end, these great fantastical tales. Um, and she couldn't read and write in any language. And so it was my interest in sound and song that brought me to poems. That, it was through the act of translating these songs that I realized that I had been interacting with poetry all along. Wow. Um, could you uh, share a poem with us, another poem with us, um, bringing in the musicality that you speak of? You know, the music. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you. This poem is called Kuli. And um, it's a kind of poem called, I'm calling a chutney poem. And a chutney poem is based on uh, folk songs from the Caribbean, um, in Indian communities in the Caribbean. And so what it does is it blends Caribbean Hindustani or Bhojpuri with um, Caribbean Creole languages like English Creole, um, as well as English language. And so um, one thing to notice in this song is that the mukra, the chorus of the song, will be in Caribbean Hindustani. Um, and so what I'll do is I'll read the poem through, starting with the mukra, 
in Hindusani. And then at the very, very end, I will read the translation. Awesome. Thank you. Kuli. Kuli naam dharaya, je hamke tej pukkarai, jaisan churi kaate hamke, gayana wa aike. With this whip scar, iron shackle name, aja contract bound, whole day cut cane. Come night, he drink up rum for so until he wind up and pitch in the trench black water and cry, oh manager, until sugar and pressure claim he to I. The Bakra manager laugh we. So come, so done. I was born a crab dog devotee of the silent God, the jungle God, the God crosser of seas. White tongues licked the sweet demerara of my sores. Now, stateside, Americans erase my slave story. Call me Indian. Can't they hear Kalapani in my voice? my breath's marine layer when I say, they made us hold the name Kuli. Like a cutlass, it bit us coming to Guyana. Wow, that last line, that last line, oof. Uh, so in your work, there's this like inextricable tangle of countries, languages, religion, caste, sexuality, layer upon layer. And the word which comes to mind when I read your work is palimpsest, um, where I see glints of the past, whether mythology or family history, which just shines through the present. And um, so you're often identified as a Guyanese or Indo-Guyanese poet, but you were born in London, grew up in the United States, uh, spent time in Canada and India as well. So when people ask you, where do you come from? How do you respond? And how does your work inform you as a poet? <laughs> Thank you. That's such a complicated question. <laughs> you know, like, because like always in that question is, you are not from here. You yeah. know, that's the, the, Im, the implicit part of it. Um, there's a saying that my friend taught me um, when I lived in Varanasi. Mm -hmm. He said, uh, 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 Desi murgi videsi chal. Yeah. Which the chicken is Indian, but the way he walks is, is like foreign. Um, and I feel like that's pretty much how I like to summarize this kind of thing. It's like, you know, I am from uh, a tradition of crossing oceans and crossing land masses. And so um, I come from a family who is South Asian by way of Guyana and the Caribbean. So it's a complicated level of belonging that I can articulate to people. And it's funny because not everyone can understand when I say this. So what I will do is based on who that person is and what I know of them and what I can divine of our present context is how I'll respond. So for example, for white folks in Massachusetts, I'll say things like, oh, um, I'm ethnically Indian, but from the Caribbean. Or if it's like uh, you, for example, I would say, oh, I'm Guyanese. And so that would have some kind of historical weight to it when I would say that. So it's, it's really complicated. Uh, to untangle all of these things. And I, what I really like about it is that it's so incredibly complex and woven together as like, you know, a very fine, tight weave that to, to take one thread out would mean that the, the cloth itself would rip. So. Wow, that's uh, only a poet could put it that way. And, and it's, you know, it, I, I feel that in your work, you celebrate that tangle. You, um, you don't think of it, you know, as a bad thing. I mean, sure, it's a complicated thing. And part of it is maybe trying to, like, unravel it. But at the same time, also celebrating the way it holds who you are, right? Um, in fact, one of the poems of yours um, in The Cowherd's Son, which I absolutely love, and I hope you'll share with us, is, um, well, there are two of them. There's... Um, the, the poem on Sita, which I would love for you to read, um, as well as um, the poem um, Kao Maina, a details of story. So um, please, please, um, I'd love, could you read that for us? <laughs> yeah, thank you, thank you. Um, so Sita, um, this is a poem be that I wrote for all of my um, four mothers, mm -hmm. um, uh, the women that I come from, whose names we don't recall, because our way of keeping our histories are very patriarchal. 
um, you know, in my family. And so I, I, I can say seven generations of the men that I come from, but I only know two or three of the women. Um, and this is like familial too. And so I named her Sita, um, or this is dedicated to that ancestor, ancestress, Sita. Sita signed her sentence with a thumbprint. That morning, she filled the lamp with mustard oil to keep burning until she came back. The Arcotia recruiter for the East India Company dressed as a wandering ascetic. He begged at her door. He hypnotized her with coins in the shape of deer. He bared his 10 demon heads demanding her memory. Sita's eyes glowed gold. Held at the Kolkata shipping dock, the first sea she would know, Sita sat on a chariot bound for the city of gold. Her jungly children were yet to run through the Amazon barefoot. Cutlass mangled eye and limb chopped India out of Kuli, a new word for her labor. She cried for the heart that betrayed her. Her skeleton calluses hardened into a Guyana map. Every night, Sita's dream flickered. She saw herself changed by the black seas. Every night, Sita dreamed an India that did not want her back. The golden stag glinted, fleeing deeper into the forest. Wow. Uh, the way you have brought Sita uh, to life, you know, her perspective of being an indentured um, laborer, it's just, it, it amazes me to see how many different avatars of Sita still live on right, in, in poetry and literature, you know? And, um, you know, you bring things so beautifully together. Um, your poetry and translation work is steeped in a painful history, of dislocation and indentured servitude. Um, what are your thoughts on the role of a poet as a witness and historian? Should poets from other cultures bear the res responsibility of representing the culture that they come from or the culture they've inherited? Thank you, thank you for this question because I wonder about this too. I wonder about the burden of representation and what that means for us as poets, you know, living with these like, um, at the nexus of multiple identities or in the intersections or, um, or the, with the assemblage of all of these identities. Um, and I think that for me as a poet, I write from, my own voice, which stands at the intersections, which cannot help but bear the, the weight of these histories and this, these stories. Ways that my history have been narrated to me, narrated to me, um, has, have been through folk song, have been through talk story or, um, you know, sessions of talking with elders uh, that also include spontaneous, you know, eruption into song. Um, it's multilingual. It happens in Creole, English, and some Hindustani, some Bhojpuri, some Hindi. Um, and so when I think about voice and I think about how I sit at these intersections, that's when the poems come to me in all of their own complications as well. And so definitely for Kaumaina, it's a, it's a, it's a long, it's a, in the book, there are five sections and it's a very long and, and drawn out story. Right. Um, but what I can do is I can talk a little bit about how that works for me um, in that I see poetry as a way of making what would have been lost to my generation um, available in a different way, in a way that is, people can understand it's like belonging to a literary tradition because so often our oral traditions don't make it into the same kind of a uh, high culture, uh, you know, high culture as the written word. Um, and I come from people who don't necessarily keep their histories by writing them down. Um, and so, of course, it's going to have all of these, like, magics and musics to it. 
Should I read this uh, a yes. section? Yes, please. I would love for you to. Thank you. Kaumaina. Aji tells a story. Ego. Bahut pahile ki baat hai. Ego raja rahi. Aur ukar hal bahut bura rahi. So come, so done. Long time day, the king been a sick bad bad. And sickness them o jaman kyan cure. One ahir, kaumaina nim ram lal. Bin a mind kao. I bin a keep em and take em one one time for grace apostra. Ahir na binda. You know how them are here to stay what kind of work they must do. Them a mind cow for the milk and them just make pera, barpi and so. So this Ram Lal been a mind guy in him. Where up and guy and kick Ketu and me charawat charawat eki mitti awaj sunan. Or e sorela awaj ego lurki kedahi. Etna, etni miti. He been a walk up pasture and take a cow them for graze. And when he put the foot down on a soft mud, he one nice. And all a sweet pice was sing so. A hiroa, hiroa, hadipe na kuchale. O her gulab lutike bayaham ke mare. Kaumaina, kaumaina, namash me bone. May brother kill me on the side and take my flower rose. Wow. And then I offer an English translation. So, um, I, I love this poem so much, and I'm sure when our audience hears it, they'll realize why and love it too. Um, in this poem, and then in much of your poetry, you flit in and out of different languages with such ease. Um, you know, in, in, in this poem, like you, you know, you go between Bhojpuri, Guyanese, Creole, and English, and you know, it has such an exquisite effect, such a powerful effect. Um, how difficult is it to write like this? Um, you know, does it come to you naturally? Or um, is it something like, you know, that you have to think about and braid together very carefully? And so, yeah. With, oh, go ahead. With this poem specifically, Kaumaina, Aji tells a story. Um, I, it's, a, it's a reconstruction of the story my grandmother used to tell me. And so I would, I, I, I would sit and think, like, how would Aji say this? How would my grandmother say this to me? And so I would go back and forth with writing it in this way. And yeah, I mean, I feel like writing in, in Hoshpuri and Caribbean Hindustani exercises a different part of my muscle memory of my my body than you know writing in creolese or writing in english does um which are you know they're they're closely related but they're completely different um and i think that for that poem it was so much about imagining and remembering my grandmother telling these stories but with like you know the 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 poem like huli for example and the chutney poems with the with the courses that are in hindustani it's actually a little par more paratactic, uh, the relationship. The, the, the couplets in Hindustani would come to me and I would then create the poem based off of those couplets. Wow. So, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's an interesting thing, multilingual writing. Um, I mean, so many of us live with more than one language, uh, you know, and I think that like, uh, you know, we're so often told that oh, we don't know enough of this language to write in it. And I want to say that that's not true. Um, that's what uh, our colonial masters in Guyana wanted us to know, so that we wouldn't speak our languages, so that we wouldn't pass down, you know, the, the ilm that we had, the, the, the knowledge that we had. Uh, that's such an important thing, because sometimes I feel like we have to give ourselves permission or, you know, just remove the censors in our mind. And that sometimes people don't realize that that is inherited. It's a psyche that gets passed down to us and that we have to overthrow that. And um, you do that so beautifully and so strongly through your work. Um, so I think we're going to have to wrap up, but just a quick question and maybe you can read a poem, another poem for us. Um, so when people talk of memoir or autobiography, they never think of poetry as autobiography, right? But I find that Poetry is like the ideal framework to capture and hold memories. It's almost like you have a window, right? And I, I mean, obviously there's so much real life in your poems and you are uh, working on a, a poetic hybrid memoir. So um, what are your thoughts about poetry as autobiography? Thank you for this. Poetry is such an interesting and queer genre in that 
nothing exists in the same way as it does in other genres, for example, time and compression. Um, you know, narrative thread can be something that's emotional or visual rhyme or uh, lead by association. And I think that for me, it works, poetry by leading with association works in a, the same way that memory works. Mm -hmm. And so I think that there's a, a pretty good natural crossover between things like memoir, nonfiction, and poetry. Uh, you know, in that you know, the poet's eye is able to zoom in on, let's say, image and extend a metaphor for the duration of a poem. Well, why not for an essay? Or what if the poem actually looked like prose and instead was actually a poem? What if we conceived of everything as poetry? Absolutely. Um, that, that's how I see life. Everything is poetry. And that's how I process it. And that's good and bad. <laughs> no, I, I was in a workshop uh, that, Amy, that was led by Amy Nezukmutatil, and she said that one of the things that she likes to do is to assign her students uh, haibun poems that are, you know, a, a section right, of prose. Right. And then a haiku, right. And having them write many of them and weaving them together as essay. And I was like, ah, this is a really, this is a good way to approach nonfiction uh, in a way that makes sense to a poet. <laughs> that, that's so true. And I mean, I, I learned so much. I mean, as you know, one gets older and older and write, writes more and more that there are always new ways of saying things, you know, even though like, you know, some people stick to form and things like that, but there, there, there is always, I mean, and maybe we haven't discovered them and like your chutney poem, for example, um, that we should dig in, we shouldn't be afraid to create, we shouldn't be afraid to innovate. And I think that's where multiple experiences and languages comes in. It helps us sort of like break the syntax and, you know, come up with new things, right? Um, so uh, if you could share, a last poem with us, that would be wonderful. Um, yeah, sure, I would love to. Um, so I think the poem that I'm going to share is going to be uh, based on an old uh, Hindi film, um, and this is called Guide, uh, and it's based on the 1965 film starring Devanand and Wahida Rahman. Uh, I love that movie. Oh, the movie is so good and so heartbreaking in all of the right ways. Yes. And if you, if you know the movie, then you'll, you'll catch on to the little parts of this. Awesome. Guide. And oh yeah, maybe I should say also. It's because uh, there's like a spiritual yearning that the, the sinner goes through that I feel, you know, that we can find through connection with people. And that part of the movie responded to. Or I mean, I really responded to that part of the movie. So guide. In the desert, if I say Ram or Rahim, Will the clouds break into a steady drum? If sky cracks, I will sing for you, stamp my feet into ribbon. What if I said, even in the night, where your hair's perfume torments, I am still parched? There are no lowly births, clouds too, begin first as sea. Would you believe that I could leave the world drawn up by the sun as a saint, me, a forgery of a man? I watched you dance like a cobra. What does it take to be so bewitched by spirit? I spend the dark with whiskey making a mask of withered roses. How quickly a shadow can pass and you become a stranger. Beautiful, Rajiv, uh, absolutely gorgeous. Um, I am just so excited and so honored to have this conversation with you and uh, bring it to the Bangalore Poetry Festival and behalf on behalf on behalf of all of us, thank you. Thank you so much uh, for being with us. And um, yeah, we'll, um, we'll be taking your words and they'll stay with us for a long time. Thank you so much, Ajit. Yeah. Thank you. The pleasure is absolutely mine. It's such an honor to be here with you. Thank you.